Imagine slashing your application's response time by half while cutting your costs significantly. Chances are you've experienced slow loading applications and have been surprised by your AWS bill at least once or twice. It's frustrating for your users and is costly for you as well. So what if there's a way to supercharge your performance and the cut down on your costs? The answer is an effective caching strategy. Caching is the unsung hero in system design and is often the key to achieving great performance, scalability, and cost efficiency in the cloud. And in this video, I'm going to tell you everything you need to know about caching for serverless applications. So strap in and let's get the show started. When you're building serverless applications with services such as AWS Lambda, you get auto-scaling out of the box and your function's concurrency would grow as your throughput grows automatically. But this scaling has limits. Eventually, you will hit the burst concurrency rate limit, which is somewhere between 500 and 3000 depending on your region. And this is the maximum amount of concurrency that you can scale to in a burst and is applied at the region level. So if you have raised your account level concurrency to 10,000 and you experience a burst of traffic, then you're able to scale from zero to 3,000 concurrent executions across all of your functions instantly. But any excess invocations will be throttled and the burst limit is going to go up by 500 every minute. And so to achieve your peak 10,000 account level concurrency, it will take you 14 minutes and probably many throttle requests along the way. And that's okay if your traffic is very stable and doesn't have many sudden bursts. But if your traffic is bursty, then the burst concurrency limit and the 500 per minute rate of scaling might be a problem. For example, if you're broadcasting live events, or if you operate a large food delivery service where traffic is concentrated at certain times of the day. When I was at The Zone, which is a popular sports streaming platform, we saw a peak of 2 million concurrent viewers for important sporting events and pretty much everybody logs in just before the event kicks off. So our traffic was very bursty. And so we had a rule for all the services that sit on the critical path of a user logging in and start watching an event. That if a service is not cacheable, then it has to run in a container where it's easier for us to schedule auto-scaling actions based on the sporting event calendar. But we also had a few services whose API responses are highly cacheable. So Lambda is absolutely fine because most of the traffic will be served by the cache and did not put any pressure on our actual backend services. So caching makes your application more scalable by absorbing most of the traffic and serving them out of the cache. So the response time is also much faster as well. And for serverless applications where you are paying by the request, not by uptime, then it can really help you save on Lambda and the DynamoDB costs. A while back, I helped a client launch a new social networking app, which launched with tens of thousands of users signing up in the first month. And despite the app being quite chatty and data intensive, our monthly AWS spending was actually only around $60. And most of that was going towards apps and caching and the CloudWatch. And this is thanks to the fact that we had an average of 99% cache hit rate. So most of that traffic never reached our Lambda functions or DynamDB tables. And so caching is great, but there is still the question of where do you cache your data since there are so many different places and ways to do it. I'm going to give you a tier list of the best places to apply caching later in the video. But for now, let's talk about your options. Given a typical API running in AWS, you have root 53 as the DNS, which maps a custom domain name to a CloudFront distribution whose origin is an API in API Gateway, whose HTTP requests are handled by one or more Lambda functions that read and write data in DynamDB tables. And in a typical setup like this, you can apply caching in multiple places. But don't forget, we also have the client application, maybe a mobile app or a web app. And I think it's a good idea to always enable caching in the client application so you cache as close to the end user as possible. And this works great for data that is either static or seldom change, things like image assets or HTML markups. And HTTP has a rich set of headers that lets you control and fine tune the caching behavior as well. But if that's the only caching you do, then at best, you can cut down the number of round trips to one per client, which is not very efficient. So you want to combine that with server-side caching as well. And you can cache API responses at the CloudFront layer, which cuts the number of round trips to just one per edge location. 
and it doesn't require any code change either on the front end or the back end. And CloudFront supports caching by query string parameters, cookies, and headers, so it's easy to cache bust when you really need to. And it even supports origin failover as well. So if CloudFront gets an error from the primary origin, then you automatically try to fetch the data from the secondary origin, which might be the same API, but running in a different region, which helps you build more resilient systems. And in most cases, CloudFront caching is all the service are caching that you would need, but it's not without its limitations. For example, it only works for GET, HEAD, and OPTIONS requests. And if you need to cache other responses, then you can cache at the API gateway level, even though in most cases, all you need to do is to cache the GET responses, which even with API Gateway's own caching mechanism, only GET methods are enabled by default. So you still have to enable caching for the other HTTP methods explicitly. And besides being able to cache POST and the PUT requests, which again is highly unusual, another reason to use API Gateway caching is that you have more control over which part of the path goes into the cache key rather than just treating the path as one thing, which is what CloudFront does. Again, this is also a rather unusual requirement to take different path parameters into the cache key and omitting others. And it's not something that I've ever had to do myself. And also with API Gateway caching, you are essentially paying for a cache node, which is fully managed by API Gateway, but you do have to pay for uptime. So even if you don't use it, you will still be charged by the hour, which is something that serverless developers frown upon. The next place to cache data is in our Lambda functions. The simplest form of this is to declare variables outside of the handler, which will be reused across invocations on the same worker instance. And so the load HTML function here will only fetch the HTML content on the first invocation and cache it thereafter. This takes advantage of the fact that Lambda execution environments are reused and is one of the official best practices recognized by the Lambda team. The problem or limitations of this in-memory caching is that it's local to the worker instance and therefore has a high cache miss because every worker instance has to initialize its own in-memory cache. So to improve the cache hit rate, you can introduce a distributed cache such as an Elastic Cache cluster. But seeing as Elastic Cache requires VPC, so that's gonna add a whole bunch of overhead, potentially needing a net gateway as well so that your function can continue to access DynamDB and the other AWS services. And again, you have to pay for Elastic Cache by the hour. So I'm really not a fan of using Elastic Cache. And I would suggest you use Memento instead, which is a serverless cache that offers you a pay-per-use pricing model with a generous free tier that includes five gigabytes of data per month, which should be more than enough for a lot of low throughput applications and also those lower environments such as dev or test or staging. So I'm a big fan of Memento. The main drawback is that introducing a distributed cache requires some code change. And the last place you can add caching is in DynamDB itself by using DynamDB Accelerator or DAX, which unfortunately is also charged by the hour. Seriously, why are they always charged by the hour? Anyhow, with DAX, the cache node is fully managed and it requires minimum code change. On top of that, it's also a write-through cache so when you update an item, it will invalidate the cache response for the item as well. But it doesn't work for query or scan results. So if an item that was part of a query response was updated, it doesn't invalidate the query response. This introduces some interesting eventual consistency challenges like deleting an item, but it still comes back in a query result. And when a user tries to get the item, they get a 404. And so to summarize, there are a lot of places where we can use caching to improve the scalability, performance, and the cost efficiency of our application. But where should we use caching? And how many places should we cache data? With those questions in mind, let's put the options we discussed in a tier list. I would definitely put edge caching with CloudFront and the client-side caching on the S tier. You pretty much always want some client-side caching. And as I've said before, in most cases, Caching at the CloudFront level is all the server-side caching you need. And on the A tier, we have distributed cache with things like Memento. It's very flexible. You can use it to cache all kinds of things, not just API responses or database query results. You can cache results of computations or any number of things. The only reason it's not on the S tier is because it does take a bit more work 
and you need to modify your code to take advantage of it. On the B tier, we have in-memory caching in your Lambda functions. It's only a B tier solution because its use is fairly situational, and as discussed earlier, it's localized to the Lambda worker instance and therefore has a high cache miss rate. Then on the C tier, we have DAX, which is even more situational in its use. In the right circumstances, it can be a very useful tool to have, but it's not often that you come across a use case that screams for DAX. And lastly, on the D tier, we have API Gateway Caching, which can address some really edge cases that CloudFront caching just won't do, but in over seven years of working with API Gateway, I've not had to use it even once. So it makes you wonder just how useful it is, and that's why it's smack bottom in our tier list. So that's it. That's everything I have to say about caching for serverless applications. I will see you in the next video.